Turn to someone next to you and say, I'm singing my way out of this prison. And now, you might not know if you are in a prison, since there are no obvious chains and cells, but I want to make the case that bondage, bondage of all types abound. And we find ourselves in prisons imposed in prisons of our own making. And I think it's important to point out that we were not created to be in bondage. Uh, And Jesus did not escape the grave for us to take his place in them. I thought that was clever. You didn't say anything, but that's okay. In essence... Don't go into graves. Don't willingly walk into the prisons that have been imposed. When Paul and Silas took their ministry to the Roman colony of Philippi, they found a city in bondage all around them. A city in bondage. There were no obvious chains or cells. I'm talking about spiritual bondage. I'm talking about religious bondage. I'm talking about cultural bondage. Economic bondage. People bound. Not free. Not living fully. Paul and Silas encountered a girl who is held in bondage by a spirit of divination which also means she's held in bondage to an economic system that allows someone to own her body. Her body and her gift are held captive by others for material gain. They also encountered the owners of the girl. That sounds weird that someone owns another human, but they encountered the owners of the girl who are bound by a culture and an economy that encouraged them to traffic in the control and exploitation of other people for profit. And then Philippi itself, the city itself, is bound by uh, an imperial religious cult. If you let me let me let me just say what it the imperial religious cult, it basically says this is a city that must worship Caesar. That's what it means. That no matter what your religion happens to be. Rome requires that you worship Caesar. So Philippi is a city that is bound to an imperial religious cult in which the people must celebrate and worship Caesar. They are also bound to this colonial power which demands that you act right, meaning if you don't, you can probably get killed. After all, This Roman Empire is the one that crucified Jesus. But Paul and Silas are Easter people. That's right, we are still in Easter. And Paul and Silas are Easter people. They don't know how to be in bondage. They are troublemakers. See, they they got the news. They're free. So this bondage all around them doesn't feel comfortable. They don't know how to accommodate themselves to to the bondage in Philippi. They are confessors and proclaimers of Jesus Christ whose gift of the Holy Spirit has empowered them to be witnesses. Let me break that down to you. Paul and Silas can't shut up. They're free. They got something to tell people so they don't know how to act in Philippi. And so they come to Philippi to spread that good news that God's grace and faithfulness have been revealed in Jesus who in his crucifixion and resurrection conquered death and liberated all of creation. So Paul immediately reveals the power of salvation by freeing the girl from the spirit of divination. In the name of Jesus Christ, Paul ordered the spirit 
to come out of her. And she was freed from bondage to a spirit. But she remains a slave. Bondage, bondage all around them. But here's the thing. When people of God, when people of God interfere with business as usual, when the people of God break the hold of an exploitative economic system, when the people of God interfere with the system of domination, and and if the people of God mess with the money, they're going to suffer. They're going to suffer for the sake of Jesus' name. So the slave owners arrest and drag Paul and Silas before the authorities. I'm going to tell you now, all God's children. I'm going to tell you now, church. When the people of God interfere with business as usual, somebody is going to come after us. And right away, right away, we see how an unjust legal system works. The slave owners, notice, notice, I want you to look at this closely. Notice the slave owners don't say, Paul and Silas have destroyed our profit-making scheme. Paul and Silas are interfering with our money. They don't say that. No, they invoke prejudice and nationalism. Those Jews... are disturbing the peace. Those Jews don't, 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 they're not honoring our economic and political system. They don't know how to act. Does that give you a hint about how we have created a mass incarceration system? Those over there, they are, they're not acting Right, those ethnically different people over there uh, got to be controlled. They've got to be stopped. They've got to be segregated out. Yeah, that's how it works. Paul and Silas find themselves caught up in a system that is going to strike back when they spread the good news. So they are beaten and they're locked in the innermost cell of the prison and they are fastened to stocks. Now here's where it gets real interesting. Even as Paul and Silas sit in the innermost cell of the prison, they still see this as a time of a season of celebration. I told you they didn't know how to act. They're sitting in prison And they began to sing and praise God. They're singing hymns and they're praying. Paul and Silas don't know how to act. When you go to prison, you're supposed to be scared and locked in and and worried about what you're going to do. But no. Paul and Silas are singing hymns and praising God. I call this a prison jubilee. I'm using the all-purpose definition for Jubilee. Jubilee is a season of celebration. What I really upset is that they didn't say that they were dancing because they should have been doing a little dance, even with the stocks holding them, because I'm celebrating. Why are we celebrating? We're free. But you're in prison. We're free is what they're saying. But you're locked in the innermost cell. We're free. We're singing and dancing. It's confusing, I know. But see, here's the thing. It's Easter. Oh, you all are so quiet. That's all right. <laughs> Death has been conquered. Nothing else can touch me. You, oh, I'm about to really get cheap. You can't touch this is what the... the <laughs> free and that was confusing to the guards and the other prisoners too and and by the way to modern readers Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and by the way they weren't praying to to God to set them free they weren't celebrating that they were incarcerated and by the way possibly facing death this is this is this is some serious business and they weren't minimizing how much trouble they were in because they were in trouble by the way 
And they were not minimizing how dangerous it was to be locked in a prison for being what? Jews and for disturbing the peace and for interfering with the money, for not acting like they should have been acting. This was trouble. And yet they were praying and singing hymns to God. And you know what? They were celebrating because they knew something that everybody around them did not know, that they had already been set free. That no prison can hold those whom Jesus has set free. That when Jesus conquered death, he made life and freedom possible for all. And that God was with them no matter where they were. God was with them. That is what we keep forgetting. And as they were praying and singing, there was an earthquake that shook the prison, opening the cell doors and unfastening everyone's change. A spirit of celebration, a spirit of, of, of salvation, apparently gave way to the literal loosening of their chains. Now, I'm gonna tell you something right now. I have no idea what happened. I don't know if it happened. I don't know if it's literal or if it's figurative. I'm not here to debate that with you. But what I am here to tell you is that so free was Paul and Silas that even when the cell doors flew open and their fi- the stocks were unfastened, they didn't even leave the place. Something's weird about these. The, the doors were open. The stock's unfat, and I know, I tell you, I've been in this situation. I don't even wait to see what's going on. If I hear something, I see somebody else running, I run too. I'll ask later. <laughs> and if I saw all the other prisoners running out the gate, I'll run too, and then we'll, we'll, we'll debrief when we get safe. <laughs> but Paul and Silas are so free That they do not even leave when the cell doors open. What, what, who are these people? But what I want to, what I want to point out to you is that they had no need to leave the prison because they were already free. They had no need to go anywhere. What they were doing, the singing and the praying, was was recognizing that God had already acted even before those cell doors opened. What they were doing was they were bearing witness. They were bearing witness to people all around them that there's something more important going on here. There's something that transcends cells and bars and, and, and stocks. There's something about life with God that has nothing to do with where I happen to be located. I can be stuck in the worst place in my life. I could be bound to the worst things in my life. I could be going through the worst thing in my life right now, but God is right there and my freedom is still promised. And so they were bearing witness to something. And I know they were bearing witness because not only did they save a guard from taking his own life, but the guard knew that they were celebrating a salvation that did not depend on his ability to keep them locked in. And so now he wants to know, what must I do to be free like that? What must I do to know a freedom that transcends bars and sell? What must I do to know a freedom that doesn't depend on this system of domination? Because of their testimony, because of Paul and Silas' testimony, the guard's entire household found freedom. Freedom in Jesus. Now, I hope we do not assume that Paul and Silas' posture of worship suggests that they accepted what happened to them as right or appropriate. Their praying and singing hymns should not cause us to overlook the truth that they shouldn't have been in prison in the first place. They shouldn't have even been there. And while they could tap into into that deep well of spiritual strength fortified by praying and singing, that should not lead us to forget that prison is far too often a means by which powerful people oppress weaker and innocent people. And while this prison could not hold them, this should not cause us to assume that justice will be done for far too many Far too many others who are confined to the innermost cell. There are some people who shouldn't be there. And I know it is not easy, nor do I expect people to exhibit the kind of jubilant spirit 
that they exhibited when you find that when we find ourselves experiencing bondage. I know that's not possible. I'm not asking that. I'm not exhorting anyone to pray and sing when we find ourselves in some some tight places or held captive in a, a literal or figurative prison. I'm not suggesting that praying and singing, singing will somehow magically free us from anything that we're going through. I'm not suggesting that at all. And I'm sure, I know it can be disorienting to see someone praying and singing when the force of an unjust system is bearing down upon us. I know this because on the afternoon that Jamar Clark, after Jamar Clark was shot by police in, the, in North Minneapolis, a bunch of us clergy and people of faith went out only a few hours after the shooting, went out and stood at the fourth precinct. And there was nothing really going on there. There were a few people who had already begun to occupy the front doors of the precinct, but the rest of us were just milling around, asking questions and trying to you know, figure out what had occurred. And... But then we church folks started praying and singing. And we were singing songs of God's victory. We were praying to God to to let cooler heads prevail and that justice be done. And as we were singing and praying, a bunch of young, angry men came in and said, why are you all singing? Why are you singing? What what is this? That's not going to do anything. It's not going to change anything that happened. Stop singing, stop praying. They were filled with so much pain and rage. So it's just a waste of time. This is, what, this is what we do all the time. We get killed, we get, we, we, we get treated badly and all you all want to do is sing and pray. And they said it was a time for action, not for singing and praying. And their critique of the system was apt And it mirrored much of what Paul and Silas encountered in Philippi. They were right that the justice system that ensnared so many young black men was characterized by exploiting racial biases and nationalist fervor. And they were right. Our praying and our singing hymns were were not going to magically free us or them from a broken and unjust system. But what they did not understand And what we were at pains to try to prove to them is that praying and singing hymns is action. Praying and singing hymns is action. It can shake the foundations. I'm not talking about an earthquake that will shake your cell doors loose. I'm talking about shaking the foundation that we can see differently about how to be God's people. No, no, I'm not, singing and praying is not a waste of time. We pray and sing hymns because we trust God's will be done as it is done in heaven. Oh, this is not a waste of our time. They didn't understand and we were trying to explain. We're not praying and sing hymns because we assume, we assume that this is going to soothe every, everybody's pain and discomfort. And we weren't singing because we didn't know what else to do. It wasn't a sign of our weakness or our lack of imagination. On the contrary, our praying and singing was bearing witness that God is the source of our freedom. That our freedom does not depend on what the human condition is. Our freedom depends on a God who sees us, knows us, loves us, and wants us to be free. Our praying and singing is letting people know that we do not intend to accept the way things are. We're singing our victory and we are singing our resistance. That's what a prison jubilee is. It is tapping into a time of celebration even when things just aren't going the way they ought to go. And so when we are in prisons that have been imposed, or prisons of our own making, 
God is with us. And just maybe, maybe, if we can fashion our mouths to say a prayer or sing a tune, the very power of the prayer and the song will shake the foundation and let us go free. It is a time of celebration no matter what we're going through because God is with us and Jesus has set us free. Amen.